Welcome back to another episode of the Just Now podcast. My name is Anton Taylor, and this is a podcast about grit, grace, and getting punched in the face. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Jess Manemini. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Just Now podcast. I'm super excited to be here. And today we are joined by an absolute boxing legend in Kevin Lorena. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Ant. Appreciate that. It's really, really cool that you could find some time in Cape Town to pop by. That's awesome. Thank you. It's awesome. It's a beautiful gym and I'm just grateful to be here. We'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our sponsors. Iron Curtain Security is a software and hardware company that specializes in the supply, installation, and design of CCTV and early warning detection security. For more information, visit ironcurtainsecurity.co.za. Ligam Fight Gear supplies fighters, coaches, and gym owners with premium quality, competition-grade traditional fight gear with a modern edge. All Ligam Fight products are designed, tested, and engineered by professional MMA fighters. For more information, visit ligamfightgear.com and use the promo code JUSTNOW10 for a 10% discount when purchasing. So Revive is a hydration formulation that is the perfect balance between magnesium, sodium, and potassium that delivers optimal hydration to your body. Just 750 mils of water mixed with one Revive is all that you need for optimal hydration. For more information, visit getrevive.co.za. So... I'm really interested in how you got started in boxing, and I'm sure you've told the story many times, but you you didn't really have your conventional, you know, long amateur career or an amateur career at all. Uh, did you just wake up one day and go like, I'm going to be a pro boxer? No. To be honest, I, my, my dream at the time, I was very fortunate enough to go to a, a good school. I went to King Edward School in Johannesburg, which is a rugby school steeped in tradition of sport and, and ethos, and I wanted to be a rugby player. So throughout school, you know, I played first team at Cares and then I was on the brink of like under 19, Curry Cup, Vodacom Cup, Sharks, Lions, that's kind of where I was. But before that, from the age of 15, I'd go to the boxing gym every single morning with my brother just to train because I loved that too. But being in a school like Cares, you know, rugby is what you play or if it's a second, a second term sport, rugby is what you play. Throughout the year, you're still training rugby for the following season. And uh, I just, obviously, rugby was mainstream, but I always had a passion for boxing. I would always go to the gym every single morning to train before school without fail. When my brother went to the gym as a normal client, we had a boxing trainer, he'd go to the gym, he'd take me with him. And that's kind of how I fell in love with the sport. I didn't think I'd become anything, you know, I never thought that I'm going to be a, a professional, but I love the sport and I love to fight, to be honest. And um, this channeled my energy the right way is when I got turned turn pro at 18 years old. But um, how it unfolded, it's a crazy story. I mean, I mean, you've said how many times people have asked me, and it's just hard to, to, to pinpoint why boxing. I don't know, boxing chose me. That's the best way to put it, boxing chose me. And um, I was fortunate enough to meet Peter Smith as an 18-year-old boy, and I say a boy because when you're 18, you're just a kid. And he literally took me from grassroots level and made me to the champion I am today. And that's with no amateur experience, just grit, but a strength yeah. and obviously you got to have some sort of natural ability, but like he honed my skills from grassroots level. And I think that's been the biggest attribute to my success is that um, I never had, I had to minimize all the bad habits created along the way. Cause I think a lot of fighters, maybe top trainers, they go from this amateur coach to that amateur mm -hmm. coach to this professional coach. I don't like this coach. I'm going to try this coach. And that's where bad habits are ingrained because what I teach you might be different to what Mark teaches you. Mm -hmm. And Mark, Mark might teach you something that's good and I might teach you something that's bad, but you still pick up that bad habit. And I think that's the, the mistake that happens with young fighters. But yeah, that's how my career started with boxing, but boxing chose me, but I, I must be I, honest. I'm wondering, did you, because I mean, it's, I, I think, quite unusual for a boxer to not have like, to go straight into pro and I, at quite a fairly young age as yeah. well. So I'm wondering, maybe you must have had like a, bit of a like just taken to the sport or had like quite a bit of natural talent I'm guessing too <laughs> and and I'm guessing what was the decision to go you know stuff it we're not actually going to do amateur we're going to go straight into the into the pros I'll tell you what it was and I went to one or two amateur weigh-ins hard mm. works with the amateurs you know go to weigh-ins you see if you can get a match up and I never got a match up because I was always a, a bigger guy at like 17 18 years old I was, I was probably about 100 kilograms 98 yeah. kilograms so you're not getting those matchups, and I was just like, I'm not waiting okay. another amateur yeah. queue to not get paired up, because that's also disheartening. Yeah. And then when I met Peter, you know, he said to me, look, you got potential, we're gonna train you for six months. And within that six months when I was training with Peter, I trained every single day with the pros that he had at the time. And at that time it was, uh, 
a guy called Tsapang Mohale, Chris Van Heeren. Um, there's another guy. But anyway, I was training with them. Sorry, to be some Chunu. And I was training and learning with them and sparring them and getting battered every single sparring session. But I just kept coming back for more and had the desire to learn. And, and it wasn't like six months later, he turned me pro. He no. said, don't worry about amateurs. I'm going to turn you pro. BSA came to license me. And then four months after I got licensed, I had my first pro fight in November. And then the rest is history. Yeah. I like that. My understanding with, with BSA, like you said, is that you generally you'll they'll come and observe or you'll go here in Cape Town anyway, you'll go to uh, like Kailicha one, one mm. day to the year and there'll be, you know, people observing you sparring. So they actually don't, I know of another female that actually turned pro without having an amateur career as well. They just want to see how you spar and they, yes. they give you a license. Where MMA is different, they want to know what your, what your amateur record is and then they'll, they'll watch the sparring and make a decision, you know, based on that. So it's quite an interesting differentiator. But I imagine when you turn pro at that stage, maybe it's more common now, but when you turn pro at that stage, you were probably one of the first to to go pro without having... Yeah, 100%. I think, and I think they've reversed that rule now. Okay. I think uh, from what I last heard, the guys that are turning pro have to have an amateur card. They have to have had some sort of amateur experience. You can't just turn pro. So maybe I was a bad example that everyone thought they can do it like that, but... No, it's, I think having that experience is important. Look, amateur and pro are two totally different ball games. Mm -hmm. Totally different. I mean, I've seen really seasoned amateurs come into the pros and not make it, and then vice versa. Guys who weren't good amateurs really excel at pros. Um, two different ball games, but I think it's important to to get that experience and to to, to really like prove that I want to be a pro and this is the next step. So yes, I, I didn't have to do it that way, and I was fortunate enough. Or should I say, maybe at the time, there was not much happening in heavyweight boxing mm. in South Africa. So they're like, turn this guy pro, mm. turn this guy pro, turn him pro, turn him pro. And I was one of the fortunate few that maybe came out on top, you know. But I think now they, they're obviously paying a bit of attention to amateur boxing, grassroots level kind of stuff. And, and that's, that's what you're going to need to do to, to better the sport in mm. South Africa. So boxing is a great sport, but like I, as I always said, I think the fundamentals and the, at a grassroots level, they need to pay more attention to that if you're going to want to be very competitive in the world. But now I suppose the, the trade-off is like that, that first fight that you're going into, I suppose the, the benefit of having an amateur career yeah. is that you, you know, I've had a couple of amateur fights and the yeah. first few ones were just emotion and overwhelming. So I'm wondering how you, like when you had your first pro fight, could, were you able to like lean into it and be stoked about it or or how is it because it's a lot all at once right so, yeah no like you yeah. said you've had your first amateur fight so maybe the feelings are kind of similar yeah. you know it's, it's just a blur yeah but happy once it's over and happy to be victorious but i remember how nervous i was yeah. like the build up and then the day of the fight in the change room and then the fight itself i mean i fought at heavyweight i was 18 years old for a guy called Justice Alinga, he was 110 kilograms, and his record at the time was four and one, four wins, one loss, four wins by KO. <laughs> and then there's me, he was like, no amateur fight. I'll never forget, <laughs> I spied a couple of the guys, obviously, I, you know, I've always trained hard, no matter what I do and, and been professional, but obviously sparring is not like a fight, right? Yeah. So I get hit with the a right hand again. Yeah. <laughs> in in, the, in the, my first pro fight, and like, it, it buzzes me, I'm like, <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> and then boom, I caught him and it was over. But I just, I just, that, I remember that clearly in the fight when he hit me. I was like, wow. Yeah. And this is it. This is professional boxing now. So those are distinctive moments. And, and yeah, it's, just, it's, a, it's crazy. 2011, this feels like the other day. My career's, you know, it's been a meteoric rise, but it's gone by so quickly too. You mentioned now, you know, having that first win and um, feeling like relief. And it's something we've spoken about with, like for you as well. And definitely my first pro win was the same. I can't really remember that if I was relieved after the amateur one. But the pro one for me was also like, oh, like, yeah. like you're stoked, but it's more relief than, than anything else. It, has, has, it, has that changed as the years have gone on from relief to other emotions? For sure. I think obviously I'm a 32 fight, not say veteran, but I've had 32 sure. professional sure. fights now. So it's a lot of fights. So... You learn how to deal with the emotion and the, and the feelings and, and loss too. You know, I had to deal with my first loss in 2014 and then I never lost again until 2022. Yeah. So I had to learn how to lose again. Not to say everyone wants to lose, and you need to, but you do have to learn how to it's, take it's in that loss yeah. and, and, and grow from that loss because I remembered how I did it in 2014, but then I kind of forgot because I just kept winning. Um, so the emotions and the, 
the way you feel after each fight is different. Also, the goalposts moves. So, like, some fights might be just a keep-busy fight or a six-rounder, eight-rounder, ten-rounder, but then for the last, call it uh, six years of my career, I've been fighting 12-round championship fights, world title fights, you know, eliminator fights. So, the pressure has been, it's always been on my shoulders and... And obviously each fight, the pressures are different. The opponent's different. You've got the pressures of the man you're fighting. You've got the pressures of what, 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 lay, is it, what lay ahead. You know, so the pressures always change, but how you deal with it, I think is the most important thing. You know, I always, I've always been one to set goalposts and say, well, this fight, I'm fighting for this because I'm going to get this next. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like it's, it's not a mission complete ever. Sure. Each fight is almost just an objective. And I've always looked at it like that. I say, this is my object objective. I need to win this fight in order to fight this guy. Then, then the goalpost moves again yeah. because, oh, you're going to fight this guy. It's for a world title. But what's next? A unification. Okay, I need to beat this guy so I can get the unification fight. So I've always just like moved the goalpost and, and taken it fight by fight. And, and that's kind of how I deal with it. Obviously, it's, there's no better feeling than winning. Yeah. You, 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 could, you would say the same. You would say the same. It's an amazing feeling. It's surreal. But um, I've always been one to, to want more. And I think maybe that's maybe been part of my success is just wanting more, that hunger to achieve more. It's never enough. Mm. Yeah. I've got two questions. I can hear you have got a burning question. Yeah, go, but I've got go. two questions that are linked together. The first is you mentioning your losses um, and how you had to learn to lose again yeah. and then what you take from that. So I'm curious what were your takings from your losses. But then also you mentioning the, that there's no better feeling than, than having a win. And at the same time, you've always got this goalpost that keeps moving. We've spoken previously about that feeling like absolute dog shit like a week after a win or a loss, like that adrenaline, that uh, dopamine dump that happens, you know, afterwards. So can you relate to that and how have you dealt with that? So I know I'm asking you a load of like multiple questions here, but they're kind of related. Okay, let's go about the dump first. <laughs> it's so real. I mean, I was actually, it's weird. Like my last fight, I came off a loss in 2020, December 2022. This was a big fight for me. You know, it's a, kind of like a make or break fight yeah. and it was a massive win, a complete shutout on the scorecards, eliminates a fight, world title next and then, a week after the fight, I was like, I hit a downer. When I say a downer, it's like, there's that emotional dump, that mm. dopamine dump, whatever you want to call it. And, and to deal with that is like, go away, spend time with your friends mm. and family. And, and that's after a big win. Yeah. And then after the loss, I felt with my loss, because there was so much controversy, the first week or two after the loss didn't really affect me. Week three. But then when I sat down and, and I was like, I realized and I took everything in and I realized what I actually lost. It hit me and I was like, fuck, how am I going to deal with this? What am I going to do? You know, a lot of people are like, well, hang out with your friends, go train. No, you got to deal with it. How, mm. e how everybody deals with this is, is unique. Mm. How you deal with something and how you deal with something is totally different to how I deal with something. So I think it's staying true to who you are. And then I think uh, I've always said to myself, well, I know what I want to achieve and I know the reason why I do it, mm. my why. You know, your why plays a major role in winning, winning and losing. Yeah. Because your why never changes. I mean, that yeah. leads me, because I think probably then before fights, maybe everyone which is, like, has a, a unique way of managing the feelings that come. But I'm wondering if you've had, I mean, you've obviously had a lot of success. So if you've had like a particular way of, because I'm sure people who listen or watch, either maybe they might have fights or, or it might be something in life that they're like nervous about. Yeah. And like, I don't know if you've had, if you could say if there's a particular way that you've sort of put yourself in a position when, you know, you go into things and you've fought in huge arenas where I'd imagine, it, you know, it's normal to feel some kind of nerves um, and what you've done to kind of like to, to not let the nerves get to you. I think nerves are a good thing uh -huh. and nerves are very good. They're important. Um, Chall channeling them the right way. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing. And, and using them for you. I think if you're going into big fights or any fight for that matter and you're not nervous, there's a problem. Yeah. Because you've got to ask yourself, why are you nervous? So I always say to myself, um, well, I'm nervous. I don't want to let my family down. I don't want to let my children down. I don't want to let myself down. I don't want to let my supporters down. But at the end of the day, you know, you've got to channel those nerves and say, well, I'm going to use these nerves to to put a beating on this guy and to execute the perfect game plan to beat him. So I think it's just about channeling your nerves yeah. and, and, and not letting the nerves sap your energy because that's real too. Yeah. So I, I do kind of like, I'm very lucky in a way being, you know, being a medic and being a paramedic, you know, you have to have that on off switch. So I can switch off very easy from boxing. Like yeah. I come, I spar, I think you've been there, I do my work, 
And then I get out the ring and the switch is off. Mm -hmm. The work's mm -hmm. done. I don't think about yeah. boxing the rest of the day. Do you think that, that helps having those other things? I mean, we've spoken about how we compartmentalize our lives with lots of different mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Do you think that the fact that you've got these other elements is not just all boxing helps? It keeps you busy. But if you don't manage your time and, how do I say, it keeps you busy, but it can also distract you. Yeah. You kind of got to be realistic and say, well, hey, I'm a, I'm a professional boxer. This is what I do in order to be a success. So I can't be doing this, 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 and this mm -hmm. and, and, lo and, and losing on the boxing. So I'm always like, as long as my boxing work's done, I can do anything else with it, you know, anything else goes. So I think the most, you know, it does take you away from the sport and puts life in a different, mm -hmm. in, looks at life in a different, different perspective for me because, you know, it's obviously dealing with other things. But then there's the side of it, if you're looking at hormones and cortisol dump and all that kind of stuff, adrenaline dump, you, you're going to have that when, you, when you're a paramedic or you're in, mm -hmm. involved yeah. in, in that type of industry or tactical medicine or whatever it is. So you kind of got to be careful. You know, when I'm preparing for a fight, I'm preparing for a fight. I'm all in. Yeah. But having said that, it's not like I walk away from boxing if I don't have a fight and I don't train and yeah. you know, I'm always grinding. Mm -hmm. Put it that way, I'm consistent and doing the pyramids and stuff and, and the other business stuff that I do, it just adds to Kevin because I've always wanted to be, I'm not the boxer, I'm not boxing. Boxing is a part of me, but boxing isn't me. There's more to yeah. Kevin than just boxing. I think that's the most important thing is, is who are you outside of these ropes? Mm. It's the most important thing because everyone knows in the ropes, you come, you get your work done, you stay true to the ground, you leave, you win, you lose sometimes. But who are you outside of the ring? Because that's what's going to last with you for eternity. Sure. You can't fight forever. Uh, you can't. You man, really yeah. can't. I've always said that to people. I've said it to my teammates. I've said it to people who ask me the question. You cannot fight forever. So when I step out of those ropes, who am I? Because yeah. people lose their identity when they retire. Mm. I've seen so many fighters that that fought in the past or were, were kind of successes in the past that are still trying to live that moment or living vicariously through somebody else. Yeah. When you step out of that ring or you walk away from the sport, walk away from ever with your dignity and say, I did everything that I could, but there's more to me than this. Sure. Yeah. Then, and that's why I do other things because I just want to create that identity outside the four, the four corners. It's super powerful, sure. hey? Yeah. Wow. I'm wondering, we spoke a little bit about um, you know, channeling your, your nerves in the right way. Do you have any kind of pre-fight rituals, in-camp rituals or pre-fight rituals, things that you kind of need to tick to mm. know that you're prepared? I'm a person who follows structure, Jess. So, you know, my training camp, this is the time I train. This is the time that I do my recovery. This is the time I do my strength and conditioning. So I'm pretty much robotic when it comes to training camp. I get the work done. You know, once the work's done, I come home, I spend time with my family, I spend time with my friends. I've got a good balance. You know, I don't drink, I don't smoke during training camp. Well, at all. <laughs> <laughs> at all. Specifically well, I, then. <laughs> I don't drink and exactly. I don't smoke. So um, what I'm saying is, like, i got structure. And then, you know, the fight day has always been the same. You know, I wake up, I go do my power-up session. I go basically train the morning of the fight with my conditioning coach to fire the muscles up. So Josh puts me through a routine. Then my meals are kind of structured. I know I have my oats and protein. I know it sounds funny, but this is what I do. I have yeah. my oats and protein. I have my little bit of carbs. I have my chicken breast. I stop eating by like 3 o'clock, and then I just have like shakes or stuff like that, you know, to keep it nice and light. But that's what I do, and that's what I've done for many years now, and that's worked for me. So that's kind of my routine. And my brother will spend time with me on fight day. Without fail, he'll arrive. Two o'clock, I know two, two thirty, the gate ringing, it's my brother, he's there. He hangs out with me until it's time to leave. And and that's just what I've done, you know. Stay away from social media on the day of the fight. Don't look at my phone, you know, obviously look at my WhatsApp family, talk to them and, and just try to be as normal as possible because I feel when you start like getting too many routines or psyching yourself up and that's that's the energy drainer. Mm. It's a normal day. You go and fight, that's the only difference. You know what's different between sparring and fighting? is the crowd, the, the carrot that's dangling, but essentially, it's the same energy systems. Mm. Mm. It's the same energy system, so why put yourself through more stress? Yeah. You know what I mean? So as you so. describe your sort of your fight camps and your day, what, what does a, uh, would you say, what, what does a day look like, say, when you're not in between fight camps and then in a fight camp? Like, what's the sort of 
the yeah what, what does the day look like so in between fights like now i might possibly fight end of october or end of november so when i get back to joburg you know i've got to be consistent in the boxing gym so peter would like me in the gym maybe like at least three or four times a week yeah. whether it's just doing some drills or hitting the bag um, doing my conditioning and running, I'm, I, I do that myself in the sense of you don't have to tell me to go run, mm. you don't have to tell me to do my conditioning. I tick those boxes because that's what a professional needs to do. Yeah. Um, Peter's never had to worry, hey, you're doing your runs, hey, you're doing your conditioning. I rock up, I spar, I put in the work, I leave. Constructive criticism, we have feedback, we talk about the session, you know, he's a master at what he does, he studies my opponents. You know, I never you're going to laugh. You know, a lot of people study tape of their fight, the, fight, the fighters they're fighting. I never look at tapes because it's highlight reels. You're only going to see the best of that person. Yeah. He'll dissect the weaknesses. He'll tell me what to do in the morning on the bag, and then tomorrow we'll execute in sparring. I never watch tapes of anyone I'm fighting. I trust that man. Yeah. He must formulate the game plan. I'll execute. And um, kind of like, so if I'm preparing for fights, I'll train in the morning, go to 10 to half past 11, 12. Whether it's sparring or bag work or skills or technical stuff, then I'll do conditioning in the afternoon. Or if it's a three session a day, I'll do my run in the morning, boxing at 10, conditioning in the afternoon, or I'll flip it around, boxing, conditioning, run. Um, if it's a hard sparring day, I usually won't do a hard conditioning because I, I, I like to spar really hard. I get the work in when it's 10, 12, or 14 rounds. Um, and then after sparring, I'll probably down regulate with a run or a recovery session. Uh, and then when I'm not fighting, like now, so I trained this morning, a little bit of a strength power-up session, and then this afternoon I went for a run. So I said kind of like, tick the boxes, right? So yes, I didn't box today, and yes, I'm a boxer. I'm not a weightlifter, I'm not a crossfitter, I'm a boxer, but I've got, I've got niggles. I've been carrying for a long time. I've you know, broken my hands, damaged my shoulders. So this is me, like I'm in Cape Town, I've got to stay active, I've got to stay current. So I put in two sessions, I tick the box. Yeah. Now, if you had to call upon me to fight in two weeks' time, like Joshua needed an opponent, if they called upon me, I'd be ready. Yeah. You know, I never get out of shape. When I say get out of shape, I might put on two or three kilograms and not be at my fighting weight, yeah. but I'm consistent. So I think that's just the thing. It's a lifestyle. You know, mm -hmm. I try to be as consistent as possible. And I know it sounds cliche because everyone may be consistent, or, but are they really? Mm -hmm. And I always say to myself, are they really consistent? Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, obviously, being in a gym with so many fighters, I see fluctuations in uh, lifestyles a lot. And the one thing that, I, that I've noticed, particularly with boxers, is that they'll do their bag work, they do their sparring, and they do their road running. But there's not a lot of focus on recovery or on strength and conditioning, like historically. Now I see guys starting to actually take that stuff seriously. But I think from an MMA perspective, um, there's always been quite a big focus on, on, on strength and conditioning. You're one of the few guys that I know that takes their strength and conditioning very seriously. You take your recovery very seriously. Why do you think it is like that in, in the boxing space? Maybe sometimes people are, they, they, they're too fixated on the old school boxing like mindset because the old school fighters, I think, would run themselves into the ground, yeah. spar themselves as hard as they can and go fight. And, and it worked for them at that time. But I think athletes are evolving. Uh, athletes have evolved since then. So why other fighters don't pay? Maybe they're not professional. I don't know. You know, I always say to myself, I don't really worry about other people. Sure. Um, I just want to make sure I'm doing and I'm doing what works for me. You know, like uh, people can ask me for advice, and I'll never lead them astray. I'll tell them what I do, whether it works or doesn't work. Yeah. I can't I can't say. So like I've like young fighters in the gym ask me what I do for recovery. So it's pretty simple. I ice bath, I sauna, I have massages. If I got niggles, I see physios, do shockwave therapy. I do everything that I can, hyperbaric chamber, yeah. to just be that. 10% better for my coach tomorrow. Because I think that's the thing, and what young fighters need to realize, is if you've had a hard sparring session today, you sparred 12 rounds, it maybe didn't go your way because you're really tired. Yeah. You've been training for six weeks, or seven weeks, or whatever, yeah. it didn't go your way, and then you've got to tick off the box of doing your run or a conditioning session, you go do it. How are you going into, into tomorrow better to be a better product for the man who's training you? Are you giving him more to work with, or are you giving him less to work with? I'll ask young fighters that. What are you giving your trainers to work yeah. with? Like, are you coming into the gym, dragging your bags, your lip hanging on the ground because you're tired and you sparred yesterday and I'm, I'm, my shoulders are sore and my wrist is sore and my heart is sore? Yeah. Or are you coming to the gym tomorrow saying, coach, I'm here, yesterday's over, I've recovered, 
and give you a little bit more today. Because, you know, that's what your recovery is doing for you. You're, you're showing the man who's honing your skills respect because you're giving him a better product to work with, to build on, should I say. That's how I look at it. Um, uh, that's, that's me. But. Is that something that you've always looked at like that? It's something that, you know, we interviewed uh, Drickus Duplessis recently, mm. and he's obviously the leader very much in his gym, um, also trying to get up-and-coming fighters to kind of level up. And something mm. that he spoke about, that he sees himself every day as having to win win the win the day, win the sparring session, and not be mediocre in that session. And um, he said he often feels that he has to, you know, bring the guys up with him. And from what you're saying now, it sounds like you kind of have that role in your gym as well. How did that, uh, have you just kind of always been the leader? I haven't always been the leader, obviously. Um, maybe the last, since 2017, when I became world champion under Pete's tutelage, I mean, yes, I'm the leader. He hasn't had a world champion since me. Um, it was Chris Van Heerden and then me. He made Chris Van Heerden a world champion. He made me a world champion. And I've paved the way for other young fighters like Rowan and uh, Keaton, who's doing really well. So I wouldn't say I'm the leader because I don't want to burst. I, sure. I, I can't like blow myself up, but I do my work and I just hope I set a good example for the other guys. Mm. Now, that's all I can I can do. You know, I can't fight for them. You know, I don't coach them. Peter must coach them. You know, I can give advice. You know, I've always, I've, I've, I'm more experienced than them. Mm. I've had, what now, 12, 11 years as a professional in the, in the, in the square circle. So I know, I know what it's about. I know what works and what doesn't work. But so does Peter. I mean, he's a, a 22 fight or 24 fight professional fighter who fought in a very hard era, who, who's, who knows what works and what doesn't work, who's had things not go his way, who's traveled overseas. So he can also just give so much more advice, you know? And he's obviously, what, 50 years old, so he's got so much more experience mm -hmm. than me. Um, so I think both of us can aid the younger guys. But I don't see it as me being a leader in the sense of, like, they, they're there and I'm sure. here. Yeah. But there's because, a level of responsibility. Yeah, I think they, 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 I think they do look up to me in a sense of uh, numbers don't lie. You know, <laughs> what, what, sure. what I've done for the sports, as a sportsman or a boxer from South Africa, it's, it's, it, it hasn't been done, really other than Brian Mitchell and a few other champions in the past. But if you're looking at revolutionizing the sport in, the, in this new era, I think we've, we're paving the way for them. And I just, I just hope that they, they see what I'm doing because they can't be like me. I've always said that I can't be like Mike Tyson. I cannot. I can't be like uh, Peter Smith, but I'm Kevin. I need to take a bit of something from everybody. I need to take a little bit of Peter Smith. I need to, I need to take a little bit of Mike Tyson I need to take a little bit of Floyd, a little bit of Canelo, but I need to be me. So take what works for them. But I, I think the biggest mistake is when fighters, for example, start fighting like somebody out, like yeah. Floyd. There's only one Floyd. Yeah. Don't try to be like him. Yeah. Don't try to emulate him. Just be you, but take a little bit of something from everybody. And I think that's what I do. And if you look at the style Peter uh, teaches, I do that style, but I've almost formulated it in my own way that works for me and my athletic ability. So talking about like age, I mean, you're, you're 31, I think, um, yes. which is, I think, particularly by boxing standards, quite young still in terms of, you know, you can, if you, if, <laughs> if you want, um, I'm thinking of what Bernard Hopkins, I think, won a belt at 46. George uh, Foreman as well. Yeah. 50. And geez, and, and the bigger guys, I think, have more longevity. Yes. Um, so in terms of like, seems like you put a lot of thought into the bigger picture, you know, not only like the, you know, possibly one day the transition to outside of the, of the boxing ring. But I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I think, well, I found as a person, as I get older, I worry less about things. So I'm wondering how it's felt getting older as a boxer. And I think you also got, you know, you have amassed a lot of experience. And, and what the, if you've thought about how long you'd like to, to carry on doing it for? Valid question. Um, I don't think you should put a cap on your career because almost mm. like, well, you're wishing it to an end at this yeah, specific yeah. time. But in a perfect world, uh, I said I want to box for another four years. Okay. See what I can achieve in the next four years. But I said that two years ago too. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not, uh, I don't feel that I'm losing the spring in my step. I feel like I'm in my, my, my prime right now, you know, in terms of ring craft, skill, strength, you know, and, and, and wisdom. Mm. I think that's the biggest thing is experience, ex ring experience and wisdom. So, but I think you'll know when it's, when the time is up. 
And I think that's the key. The biggest thing for fighters is to know when to walk away. Yeah. And I want to walk away on top. Mm. So that's, that's one thing I can say. So when the time comes, mm. I want to walk away on top. Yeah. I don't want to be a journeyman. You know, we've seen a lot of greats in the past, international and mm. local, taking fights because they need the money. I never, ever want to do that. I can, you can put that on record and put it on paper. I'll walk away way before then. You know, got dignity, got pride, and, uh, you know, I don't want my kids to be watching their dad get beat up on because he needs money. Yeah. And I'll never be that type of fighter. That's why there's life out of the square rope, the, the four corners. Um, but, yeah, you'll know when to walk away. I think that's the key is knowing when to walk away. I think you'll know when you lose a bit of that, that timing, that speed, that precision, that explosive power. Yeah. And when that starts slowing down and starts happening, walk away. Yeah. But on top. Yeah. But on top. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the biggest thing. Walk away on top. No, don't walk away after two losses. And if you have those two or three or four consecutive losses, walk <laughs> away too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of guys just, just hang in there. Yeah, because you, you want to finish on top. But like, if you yeah. have the sudden decline, I feel like some fighters yeah. are, are chasing yeah. that, I need to get back on top before I retire. But sometimes that doesn't come, right? No, the top's gone. The ladder's gone. It's been taken. The cop has been swept from yeah. underneath you. It's over. And I think that's what a lot of old happens to old fighters that they, they can't walk away. So they've they've been forced to walk away, mm -hmm. but they never they never leave it behind, you know. Mm -hmm. And I and I, I just look at it. And I'm a, I'm a, I observe people and their characters, and especially other fighters and older fighters. And I can see like a lot of them just can't walk away. And I I don't want to be that person. Mm -hmm. I really don't. I want to be the guy that's walked away, I left it all behind, you know. And I did what I could in the time that I was given, mm -hmm. you know. Everybody w would want to have done more. Yeah. You know, there's anything in your life, in your, in your filming career, whatever it is, in your fighting career, if you had to call it quits now and you look back, so could I have done more? Of course there is. Yeah. There's lots. We, we, we people, we, we hungry to be successful. So there's always something you could have done more or yeah. done better. But you've got to know that the time you're given, that's what you, you achieved in that yeah. time frame, and then walk away. You know, there's a, there's a lot of guys, I mean, I think have done well and uh, they're just seeking more. You know, don't look at like the exhibition kind of stuff, like what Floyd's doing. I think that's very different. Yeah. You know, he's a legend, but he's, he's, he's not going out there to fight uh, Crawford or Errol Spence because he knows what will happen now. Yeah. He'll lose yeah. everything. He's led, he, he's, his name, that legend status, because they'll beat him. Yeah. So he's doing exhibition stuff now. That's totally, two totally different ball games. Yeah. But I mean, like, as a purist, the pugilistic art, walk away in your rankings, within the rankings. If you can't, if, you, if it's not going for you, walk away. And that's just what I've always said that I'll do. So whether it's four years, yeah. two years, or 10 years, you know, yeah. maybe I'm still going strong by the age of 40. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you don't know. And I don't want to put a cap on it, but I said in the perfect world, I think I want to be 34, 35 years on and, 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 and achieved all I can in yeah. boxing. And I think we're kind of there. Yeah. yeah. Because like, what's, what's there more to achieve? Okay, I, I almost won the heavyweight world title. Almost got the massive fight with Usyk. Now I've been given another opportunity to fight for a world title. Maybe have a crack at the heavyweight world title again and then call it a day. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's not much more you can do. What do you want to do? Well, I notice what I notice is some fighters, it's, it's maybe less about money as I think when you're the fighter in the ring, you're the man or the mm -hmm. woman and you get so much attention. And I feel that sometimes guys struggle to for the spotlight that's not on them. And they, whether it's like telling you about what they achieved or something, and it's sometimes you want to say, I respect you, what you did was great, but you know, that, that was then and sort of let people have their, Better. so I think it's not only the money, I think it's that, the, that, that, thing, that yeah. the, the being this, the main man, you know? Um, that's exactly yeah. it. That's exactly it. People, they, 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 they miss that feeling, mm. that feeling of being the, the man in the arena. Mm. That's the feeling they miss. Mm. <laughs> so maybe, I don't know, like when I, when I reach that point, am I going to miss it? I think, of course, yeah. you know. You know, when, when people are, are cheering your name and, and the ring announcers announcing your name with all your credentials and accolades, and you're going to miss that because that, that's, what, that's what fuels you. But that's why I said when I walk away from the sport, I want something out of boxing. You know, mm. I want to, there's more identity yeah. to me than Kevin the fighter. You know, there's Kevin the fighter, and I'm grateful for that guy. But uh, there's more to me that, you know, you can establish something away from the sport. You know, you this businessman or you this business owner or you this medic. Oh, I remember I watched your fights back in 2010, 2012. Mm. You know, like you'd speak to other fighters. Now I watched you fight uh, 
You know, the late Corey Saunders, you know, I watched you fight Klitschko. You know, but you don't want you don't to be Corey, you know, like Corey's not a good example, he's passed away, but you don't want to be thinking, well, what if, could have, yeah, I yeah. want to be that guy, I want yeah. to fight Klitschko again, but you're 55 years old, you yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. happens to boxing yeah. people yeah. And, and fighting people. There's always that that thrill of, I want to have another go. Mm. And it's passion because it shows that you're a warrior. Sure. You know, male or female, you're a warrior. You, you'll never quit. There's no quit in any fighter. Yeah. Well, there, there shouldn't be, but there's no quit in anyone, really. You know, you see a lot of champions from yesteryear, like, I'll kick his ass still, but the guy's 65 years old. <laughs> yeah. But that's the inner spirit. Sure. Yeah. That's the yeah. lion, the fighting lion talking. Yeah. And you'll never lose that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think the biggest thing is walking away from the sport. The right time. The right mm -hmm. time, brain intact, being sharp, you know, <laughs> yeah. being be, like made my kids proud and, yeah. and, and not let anybody down. That's just the goal. So you mentioned uh, Mayweather briefly, and I've often wondered, like, you know, these, these top level fighters that um, walk around with security detail. And I've often wondered, like, shit, like, what kind of security detail do these big fighters have when they're like themselves like pretty dangerous humans? Mm. So I know when when maybe there was here, I saw there was an article and you were on your security detail. Yeah. Um, so that answered my question, like yeah, <laughs> how the dangerous fighters. <laughs> but um, what was like? What, what was that like? It was cool. It's a cool experience. You know, Floyd's very different. You know, he's the highest earner of all time, and I don't think any fighter, combat fighter, will surpass what he's earned. You know, over a billion dollars in, in, in revenue. It's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so he walks around with the security detail. I think it's purely for crowd control because I noticed that because of who he is and how well he's done and how famous he is, people just flock to him. So, like, imagine you're walking with your partner through Santon City and there's about 150 people storming you for photos and being a pest. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. kind of need that. Yeah. Um, I was just grateful to do it because of the boxing, you know, you know, Floyd knows. We spoke about my fight with the boy. We oh. had a good chat about that and, I mean, he took my number, we conversed. And, uh, you know, he's just a fighter, you know, but he's a very successful one. So there's that thing again, like taking that little something from someone. You know, he's a superstar. Yeah. Now, I was fortunate enough to watch him train for Pacquiao and for Andre Berto. Uh, I went to his gym, we were there for two weeks, myself and Sean Smith, Peter's brother and I was afforded the opportunity to watch him spar and, and to see him prepare. And that was also a big eye opener for me because when I came back to South Africa, I was like, we don't know what training hard is. Wow. Oh, really? Yeah, you know, that guy sparred 15 rounds, five different sparring partners, and he never, he never got out. That was one day, 15 rounds, five different guys in. Fresh legs, fresh legs, fresh wow. legs. The other day, he sparred 45 minutes nonstop. Sure. People coming in, rolling out, coming in, rolling out. He didn't have a single rest. Not one minute. He sparred flat out for 45 minutes. I'm not saying that's the right thing yeah. to do, but that's what works for him. Mm. But it made me realize you just got to do that a little bit more. He has a guy who's probably going to fight for three, four hundred million dollars, but he's working like he's broke. Mm. No, what's your why? Yeah. I mean, what would his why be? It's not only the money, but you got to say to yourself, what is it? It's a legacy. Because when you, what comes with money is, is laziness. Sure. When people start to earn a little or have that taste of victory or that taste of good money in combat sports, they can get a bit lazy or they, they forget the why or they forget the goalposts. Yeah. Get used and to the good life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think you've got to commend him for that. You know, the, the money he was earning and still earns mm. to still stay dedicated, consistent and a master. He's a master at what he does. People don't, the purists will appreciate it. The, to people who don't really understand the sport won't really, they're like, oh, he looks a bit boring. He doesn't knock people out. Mm. He's a purist and he's a master at what he does. And, and I don't think there'll be a, another defensive genius like him for many years to come. You mentioned your fight with, uh, that you guys spoke about, your fight with Daniel Dubois. Yeah. Because I think two fights ago. Um, look, it was, it was an entertaining, it was a hectic <laughs> fight. Um, <laughs> And, you know, obviously as a, as a supporter, um, you know, it, but it was proper, the man in the arena, huge stadium. What was that whole experience like? You know, we spoke a bit before filming. I mean, that's, it, it, it must have been a, a lot, yeah. It was a lot to take in, yeah. you know, just the build up alone, the media, the press conferences, the tension, and then the fight itself. So it was, it was a hell of a lot all in one week compressed. The build up was massive, you know sitting like this next to Tyson Fury at a press conference. 
know, if you go watch back at the footage, you know, banter talking about big Kev, big D, they're yeah. going to put on a big fight. It's crazy hearing guys that you look up to talking about you because yeah. they know exactly who you are coming up to you saying, are you going to come help me when I fight Usyk? You're going to beat this guy. Just be careful. He's got a punch. It's crazy. Like, how does this guy know about yeah. me? How's he watch me? But you'll be surprised that, that people know, you know, yeah. don't give yourselves credit coming from the little country down south. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. People know exactly who yeah. you are and what you do. Um, it was just a lot to absorb, but amazing at the same time. It was just like South African boxing, international high level boxing. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's crazy. Like to come to Wayne and it's packed. Wayne's got more people that are at Empress Palace when you fight. Wow. wow. It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy to see Tyson Fury, but you're the co-main event, so they're seeing you too. Yeah. So ride on it, you know, use yeah. it. Yeah, it was cool. And then obviously the fight didn't go our way. It could have gone our way, but it didn't go our way. So we learned a lot. But just the arena, 70,000 people, or six, whatever, 68,000 chanting, look, uh, looking up at Tottenham Stadium, like sold out arena, full. Just, it's surreal, you yeah. know, and I've, I've been, I'm very fortunate enough to have been afforded that opportunity, yeah. but we worked hard for that opportunity. Yeah. You know, you're fortunate you've been afforded it, but you worked hard to get that opportunity. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm grateful that I, I got to step in, into that arena and be that man in the arena. Yeah. And then obviously the result didn't go my way, but that was obviously fate or, or divine intervention for some other plan. Yeah. So that's the way I look at it. And you know, I'm better after that loss, you know, came back victorious, yeah. which shows that you know, literally the saying of when you hit the canvas, get back up, yeah. dust yourself off and carry on. Yeah. And that's what I had to do. And I think hopefully I've uh, made a good example for other young fighters or, or, or individuals in life that you're going to get knocked down, yeah. but it's what you do next that counts. Mm. So you fought across three weight divisions. Yeah. Um, there, you know, I wasn't <laughs> sure if there was another one. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Um, and at cruiser rates, I'd, I'd say from a height perspective anyway, you were pretty much the kind of the same, like you're quite a, a smaller, on the smaller side of, of heavyweight, mm. um, certainly from a height perspective, I can make it up yeah. wi wide. <laughs> but um, was, there, was there a big adjustment that you had to make going up to heavyweight? And I know I asked you off, off camera about, you know, where's your favorite um, weight division to fight? And you gave quite a good answer, so I'm interested in both. Okay, so as a heavyweight, I'm small in height. In stature, the modern day heavyweight, yes. Sure. If you look at guys like Evander Holyfield, George Foreman, Mike Tyson, we're all kind of the same size. Mm -hmm. Mike Tyson, 5'11", 98 kilograms. Holyfield, 6'1", 100 kilograms. Mm -hmm. George Foreman, 6 foot, and they're calling big George Foreman, 6'3", 110 kilograms. Well, I'm 6'1", 101 kilograms. Mm -hmm. So in that era, I'd have been an okay size. Mm -hmm. In today's era, I'm small. Mm -hmm. Joshua, 6'6". Six six. Tyson Fury, 6'8". Morris Vuck, 6'9". Deontay Wilder, 6'7". Du Bois six foot six, and then me six foot one. So I'm Usyk six foot three. So I'm a smaller heavyweight, but yeah, I think um, what heavyweight suits me best. Well, I was always the bigger cruiserweight and beating up on guys, in, and I felt I overpowered them a lot, which is true. Like when I fought cruiserweights, I, I was like, it's okay. That's why I did the step up part. Of, to be honest, is that I wanted to challenge myself, and not to say and sound arrogant like the cruiserweights were nothing, because I never got my my unification fights at cruiserweights against the tough competitors like uh, Golomari and Lawrence Akoli and those guys, because those are solid cruiserweights. But those are all cruiserweights that have gone up to and can go up to heavyweight at any given time. So it's all the bigger guys, you know. So going up was a big challenge, but uh, what weight division suits me the best, or do I find myself in the best position? The one that pays the most. And, and, I, and I say that because we laugh. It's like, what, what does he mean? Well, if you want me to fight 90, you want me to shed 14 kilograms, give me 10 weeks, a good training camp, and give me a unification fight and a good payday. If you want me to fight Alexander Usyk at heavyweight or Daniel Dubois again, well, I'll fight him at heavyweight because give me a good payday. Sure. If you want me to fight Bridgeweight against Badu Jack in Saudi Arabia, well, I'll fight Bridgeweight, give me a good payday because at the end of the day, I don't do this for... This is my livelihood. This is what. This is how I put my children through school. This is how I survive. I mean, sure. there's no secret. You yeah. know, a lot of fighters, you know, that are, are working hard to get to this position, personal training, they box, they do this, they do that. This is my livelihood now. I've, I've got to this opportunity. Now I've got to make it happen mm. and, and, and uh, you know, put my children through school. This is my bread and butter. So the, the weight division that suits me most is the one that's going to give me the, the better paycheck. So for you, moving up wasn't necessarily because cutting weight became like 
a, a hard, hard task? It did, Jess. I mean, not going to lie to you, you know, my, I sat with Rodney and Peter and I said, I'm done with this cutting weight. I want to fight heavyweight. Rodney said to me, no ways, you can't. He says, Kevin, no, you're not big enough. Just fight the unified unification fight. Get the unification fight. I said, Rod, please, just give me an opportunity. Give me a heavyweight fight. Let's look for a decent name. I promise you we're going to get an opportunity. So he said, okay, well, I'm going to listen to you. Then I fight Bogdan Dinu. We picked him because he only lost to Gerald Miller and Daniel Dubois. So I knocked him out. Then we chose Marius Vach. Why Marius Vach? Because he was, he's an older guy now. He's what, 30, 40 years old. And he only lost to Vladimir Klitschko for the world title. Dillian White. And uh, uh, Martin Bacoli. So I was like, that's a good name to beat. Mm. Beat him. Boom, beat him. Got a world title shot against Daniel Dubois. See, so it's like yeah. navigating the yeah. business aspect yeah. of boxing. And, and what I got for that fight, I never got for any of my cruiserweight seven defences of the world yeah. title as a challenger. So you know what I mean? Yeah, there's yeah. money in so, the heavyweight space, right? Exactly. The glamour division, the pinnacle. Yeah. It's just, it's, you know, not to take anything away from the smaller guys, but when t people talk boxing, you talk heavyweight yeah. boxing. You know yeah. heavyweight yeah. fighters. People want to watch heavyweight fighters because you know it's explosive. Someone's going to sit, mostly. Yeah. Most of the time, yeah. someone's going to hit the deck, yeah. if not both of us. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's exciting. That's what yeah. sells and what's put, what, put, what puts asses in seats is what, is what makes the money and heavyweight boxing does. So. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, it's so different to all the other weight categories because there's, there's just, there can be wild discrepancies in the size of people. And yes. I'm wondering what it's like against these guys. I don't know which is worse, people who have a lot of height or the size, um, you know, the, the, the weight difference, but um, what it's like fighting these, some of these monsters. <laughs> it's really. a good question. Yeah. I find it a lot easier to fight the bigger guys, okay. the taller guys. Yeah. Now take the boy out the equation because yeah. he's a very strong puncher, yeah. but a guy like Marius Vach and Bogdan Dino are much bigger than me. Yeah. I mean, I look like a dwarf against yeah. Marius Vach. He's six foot nine, 130 kilograms, Jeez. but he's slow okay. and you're sluggish. So I use that speed advantage to yeah. beat him. So, yeah, it's different. I mean, like, you're getting to my, my last fight now against Rod Murray, the same weight as me. It's almost like tail of the tape was exactly yeah. the same. Six foot one, 101 kilograms. He had 31 fights. I had 31 fights. It was kind of yeah. like a 100% matchup. It was quite a hard fight because mm. he's my size. So, mm. my size, he's fast. So, he's got a good kind of puncher. He's faster than those bigger, slower guys. And he's got a decent crack on him. He's got a 26... 26 win KO ratio, yeah. you know, 26, 26 KOs in 31 wins. So it's a big KO yeah. ratio. So he's got that power, he's got speed, and he had ring craft. So it was one of my harder fights. And he's not a big guy, he's not a six foot five monster. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's all relative. Like, I mean, what the bigger guys bring to the table is that sheer force, that thud. It's like a heavyweight punch, mm. there's weight behind the punch. When they're just turning that punch over, there's like 130 kilograms of force there. Yeah. First, a guy is only 100, but he's explosive and he's stinging you on the mm. chin all the time. It's yeah. different. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's hard to explain it, but it's different. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. it's all relative. So you've mentioned Floyd Mayweather, you've mentioned Tyson Fury. You've kind of touched a little bit on Mike Tyson here and there, but like if you were to name a big boxing idol for you, who mm. would it be? In today's era or the past? Your choice. First name that comes to mind. Mike Tyson, of mm. course, you know, he's been a small heavyweight, he was explosive, he was dynamic, but his antics out the ring is not something I want to sure. adhere to. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then you look at a guy like Canelo, you know, but he's a smaller guy, so a lot smaller than me. So Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield, I think uh, Evander Holyfield was also, remember, he was a cruiserweight that went up to heavyweight. Mm. Hell of a high work rate, through punches in bunches, knocked big guys out and he could take. I mean, he, he, he could take a, a hell of a beating. So Evander Holyfield is somebody I look up to and a star that I watch. But Mike Tyson being small and explosive, but he's also a freak. So it's hard to just watch Mike and be like, well, I want to be like him. Yeah. He's a freak. Yeah. You're not going to be like Mike. You, just, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Are you allowed to, you, you mentioned that you might be, fight, you know, you've got a potentially going to be fighting in a couple of months. I'm not sure if you can share it on camera, but mm. um, what the, yeah, because cause you, um, your most recent fight, you you won. I think it was the eliminator in the bridge weight uh, division, and there's potentially going to be a fight for you coming up. Yeah, so I got myself into the position to fight for the eliminator, which puts you number one in line to fight the world yeah. champion. Um, I can't discuss names yeah. right now because contractually we we, we can't discuss. But yeah. what I can say is, 
I'm probably going to fight for the world title in November. Who against? I can't say. But um, it's been a good business decision that uh, Peter, Rodney and I have worked on. And um, it's going to be good for South African boxing. And then it's going to be putting me in the right direction for that heavyweight uh, world title again. Um, I don't really like to talk on camera about who am I going to fight and what I'm going to fight purely based on the fact that his team hasn't announced anything mm, yet. You yeah, know, So I don't yeah. want to be the guy that announces yeah. ahead of him you know, so to yeah. show respect to him as a fellow fighter. But what I can say when I say him, it's going to be exciting and... Well, we didn't think you were fighting a girl. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Him is in the fight. <laughs> <laughs> And um, it's going to be exciting, but yeah, exactly what you said, Boxy, the business side of it is what we're dealing with right now. It's kind of, I'd say, 85% done. And who we fight in next is going to be exciting and good for South African boxing and hopefully another nice. step in the right direction. Okay. So you had a question about uh, the whole Jake Paul, Logan Paul thing. Yeah, well, I was wondering, you know, I think it's almost a two-part question, how you feel about boxing, the sport of boxing at the moment in general. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, because, look, lately we've, we've had some, some fights mm -hmm. of, of some of the best, you know, obviously Spence Crawford, everyone's, you know, super happy to see great fighters fighting against each other. Um, and then, of course, the sport has been, yeah, changed, I think, by the advent of, people like Jake Paul and stuff. And I, I thought I would just ask what your thought, what you think about boxing and these these sort of non-boxers who, yeah. I think long live boxing. Yeah. I think um, it's a great sport. I mean, it's going to have highs and lows. Yeah. You know, maybe people in the past said, well, boxing's dying now. Mm -hmm. And then people now are saying boxing's alive. So you've got to say to yourself, what makes boxing alive? You know, combat sports, what makes MMA alive? Mm -hmm. It's the guy who puts asses in seats or the individual who puts asses in seats. Mm. That's what keeps the sport alive. Now, if we go and look at the YouTube element of what's happening, Jake Paul, Logan Paul, to the purists in the boxing or the MMA fight fans, the purists, it's a load of rubbish. Mm. But it, it isn't actually. Because these guys are selling out arenas that fighters who are currently fighting can't sell out and they're bringing attention to the sport that we're in. Mm. Yeah. So you've got to say they're doing good for the sport. Yeah. They're doing good for the sport. You know, that's from the, the aspect of like looking at it holistically and, and from like perspective, it's they're doing good for the sport. Yeah. You know, yeah, that the guy never had, he never paid his dues, but you've got to give him respect. You know, he's yeah. giving it a go yeah. and he's picked his fight right. So the business side of it, he sure. fought like Ben Askren, who's a wrestler, yeah. Tyron Woodley, who's an ex-champion, um, Silva, who's an older ex-champion, yeah. and Nate Diaz, who's an MMA guy, he stand up's okay, but it's not okay for boxing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he does good in MMA. That's yeah. what he does. MMA is his forte. You know, probably if Jake had to fight him in the in the cage, he'd probably get his pops cleaned mm -hmm. by Nate. But Jake's been smart in what he's doing and he's creating awareness and he's you gotta kind of respect what they're doing. Yeah. You know, from a purist point of view, it's rubbish. Yeah. Because, so, <laughs> like, like I, I can't say it's rubbish. Yeah. I'm saying I'm a purist. I believe I'm a boxing purist. Yeah. Uh, but I'm watching. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'm watching. Yeah. And that's what they want. 100%. I think so what, was, what was so it. interesting, because I know I've been trying to rope you into, into watching the, uh, the Jake Paul documentary, because yes. I watched yeah. it, and uh, I wasn't a fan before. And I'm still not a fan, but I watched the documentary and I was like, I bought into, in, uh -huh. I bought into the, a little bit. I think what's coming out for me, what you're talking about is how important it is to have a strong why. And in the documentary, he speaks about his why being, he wants to be the highest grow, grossing pay-per-view. Like he wants to be the guy that sold out arenas. Doesn't care what people think about the actual fights that, uh, you know, how they would exactly. match up in different contexts. Or if the guy was a little old, he doesn't care. It's a big name. We fold the stadium. Um, and that's what he wants to go down being known as. And he's, He's a he knows what he's wise. Well, that's the thing. I think um, the purists will go, well, who is he? What is he doing? But the people are saying he's following his why and he's living his dream. Mm. He's living it. People are living through him. People are envy envying him, envious towards him and his brother, but they, they're not doing what they're doing. Mm. You know, I mean, if, if you look at it on a small scale, if you had to go back... Or, on, on Facebook, I don't have Facebook on those things, but if you go look back at comments, I've been shit for the last 11 years in South African boxing. 
Yeah, but I keep if you, if you read the comments. Yeah. Keep, but, but like, I don't understand. It's like, mm. what do you have to, what more do you have to yeah. do? Well, I gotta, you just got to say to yourself, well, what's my why? What have I achieved that other fighters in South Africa haven't achieved and why haven't they achieved mm. it? Mm. Yeah. Why? If it's so easy, why haven't they achieved mm -hmm. it? And you said something interesting um, before we were filming just about the pool. You said, you know, boxing is about entertainment, you know, and I think that's what makes it such a such a beautiful sport is it's obviously it's sport and it's, you know, you know, you can't, you can't, there's no substitute for being a fighter, but there is that huge element of people come to be entertained. And I think that's where that it's an interesting, you know, crossover with these entertainers and YouTubers who, look, they're bringing people in, you know. Exactly. And it's like... Um, you know, Elon Musk and old Zuckerberg, if they, I'm sure it'll be a pretty cuck fight, but <laughs> we'll we want to watch it, you, you know? <laughs> like, I, mean, I mean, look at um, the thing Drickus had to go through with mm. uh, the whole thing between him and Adesanya. Yeah. Mm. Like, I'm so patriotic, so mm. I'm 100% in Drickus' yeah, corner. Sure. I truly believe, I mean, I don't know MMA that well, but I think Drickus honestly has the beating of that yeah. guy. But... Um, Look at the hop that that created, and it yeah. wasn't for a good, for good, like for a good reason. You mm, know, it was mm. very like, a, you know, kind of, you know, it's ugly, yeah. ugly and not the way the sport should be. Mm. But it created hop, and look how many people were talking about yeah. it, and and how the the, the 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 champion was talking about it. So and he made Drickus a household name, basically. Literally, yeah. and then and then Drickus went and did what very few people thought he would do against that other guy, Whitaker. Whitaker. Now yeah. I don't know MMA well, to yeah. be honest. It's like I don't know. Like I watched the Conor McGregor's, the big fights. Yeah. I've watched, but I heard this Whitaker guy's good, decent stand up. He's good. He's going to give Drickus a hard time. Well, Drickus made him look very average. Mm -hmm. So like you know, he does this guy creating hype in the cage now, and, and he deserves it. So, but there'll still be people that say Drickus is shit. Like mm -hmm. I've heard some mm -hmm. people say to me, "Oh, he's going to get killed by the sun." I was like. I don't know. So you guys much, keep you saying know? that. The you guy guys, keeps the winning. Guy yeah. Keeps delivering. <laughs> you know, you've got to respect that man, and, and and I truly hope he does well. But that's an example of taking opportunity and running with it. Yeah. So well done to Drickers. I'm a massive fan of his, and and I truly hope he wins. Just for South African yeah. combat sport, it does so much for you guys. Yeah. Because you guys can all, all go out there and do it. It's just about getting that opportunity. Yeah. And, for sure. and, and that window and that break. That's what you need. You know, you've got to create your break and bash down the door. But when you got half that opportunity, take it and run with it. And that's what he's done. But that, uh, that makes me think, you know, it's so cool seeing, you know, I think it's fair to say you are South Africa's preeminent boxer in terms of our, I can't think of another boxer, you know, at the moment who's active from our country that's gone to the heights that you have. And it's so, it's so cool for South Africans to see one of our own on an international stage, you know, mm. like that's our accent or, you know, that's how we do it. And, um, you know, I hope that you can always feel the kind of, um, you know, there's a, it makes a lot of people proud when you're out Thank there you. and on the stage there. And it's, it's very cool for us to see, you know, with potentially, like you said, you know, potentially going to be fighting for a world title in a, in a few months. Um, it's, it's literally the kind of thing when I meet someone from another country, I'll be like, oh, you know, we've got some good fighters and, you know, they no, mention the names. So and, we, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. And I appreciate that because we need people like you that support the sport and support the fighters, you know. You're not, you can't be liked by everybody. Mm -hmm. But you know what was, what was really humbling and, and made me realize, you know, you're doing something right. It was after the Daniel Dubois fight, how many people, random people, came up to me and said, we watched your fight. Oh, you are so unlucky, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I spoke to Sean, one of the super sport guys, one of the producers, I said, go get me the numbers on that fight. When I was fighting at mm -hmm. that time, and he showed me, I was like, wow, mm -hmm. how many South African Dakotas tuned in? It was humbling. Awesome. Which means people knew the South Africans fighting, they're gonna watch, yeah. Yeah. you know? Whether they like me, hate me, or love me, they watched. Yeah. And, and that's what you wanna do, and, and, and that's your legacy at the end yeah. of the day. And when I leave the sport, that's what I want to leave behind. It's just a little bit of a legacy that I can be proud of and and hopefully cement in history. And one day I'll be spoken about as that guy who did what people said he couldn't. Mm -hmm. And that's always what I say. But that's my why. I want to go out there and do what thousands, hundreds of thousands South Africans and boxing pundits said I couldn't do. I wasn't meant to do this well. I wasn't meant to do good after my first profile. I was told he's the rugby plan is just big and strong. Now? Yeah. Now what do you say? Yeah. No, it's truth. Yeah. Like, literally, like, I've been, been told my whole life, like... But I mean, guess that, like, it. it drives you, maybe? Like, that little, yeah, like, a, when you're told you can't do something, it's like... That's oh, why, okay. like, I look at comments and I laugh. Like, people say, why don't you react? Why? I said, for what? 
said, that guy's not paying my bills at the end of the month. Yeah. Who is he? Who is he? You know, yeah. Yeah. like to me, he's nothing. Mm. To his family, he might be a little something. You know, <laughs> but to me, he's nothing. So why must I give him the light of day to entertain him and, and, and give him that gratification that Kevin replied to me? Yeah. You know, if a guy gets personal and he, and he says something rude or disrespectful yeah. towards my family, yes, I will say something. But you get to a level where you just look at it and shrug mm-hmm. it off and go, I mean, somebody might have told this man, no, you're not good at what you do. Mm-hmm. Well, who cares? He's doing what he's doing. Mm-hmm. You've got to respect him for that because he doesn't care about the man that's told him that shit. Yeah. 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 That yeah. man doesn't pay his bills at the end of the yeah. month. And I tell people that don't worry about what they say. Don't ignore the noise. Focus on what you do. Because what you do is good enough and people will eventually recognize you and what, what yeah. you do. And I just, that's my why. It's a legacy. Being the guy who defied all the odds yeah. in so boxing. Kevin, just in, run, in wrapping up, because we're running out of time, if mm. you were to, and I'm sure you have these conversations in your gym anyway, but if you were to give like up and coming fighters a nugget of wisdom to kind of motivate them and in, in maybe not fighters. I mean, we speak about it as not just fighters that, that listen to the podcast, but guys that are, females and males that are trying to make it in a sport or in a career, um, but are, you know, hit up with a bunch of challenges and potentially have thought about quitting at some stage, what would you say to them? Remember your why. I always go back to that. I know it's just like, you keep saying this. Well, remember it, because what is the reason why you started? What did you start for? What's your end goal? So have your goals, remember your why, and uh, block out the noise. There's always going to be noise along the way. Positive noise, negative noise, block out the noise and focus on your why and why you want to achieve that specific goal and the reason why you do it. Because that will give you that sense of responsibility. Your why might be different. Your why might be, well, I want to be on the biggest stage. I want to be famous. Well, if that's your why, then bash it out. If your why is I want my kids to be proud of me, I want my my kids to one day say, well, that's my dad. He did this, this, and this. That's my why. Mm. So stay true to your why. Look your kids in the eyes and say, well, that's my why. What you told me is irrelevant. I'm going to keep going. Because that's what it's about. It's just keep keep going. But also be realistic. Don't uh, take shortcuts. You know, in, in, in whatever you do, whether it's uh, acting or combat fighting or being a chartered accountant, if you take shortcuts and you start to slack on the job at hand, you're, you'll fall short. Mm. To just stay true to the ground, block out the noise, remember your why, and have that reason. What keeps your fire burning inside of you? Ignite and, and light the fame, and it will become a roaring blaze if you channel the energy the right way. Well, I mean, not only has it been a very interesting chat, man, but I'm I honestly, obje- like, objectively, it's been very, like, motivating. Like, I want to go to the gym <laughs> tomorrow train. morning, bro. Like, literally, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> we need to <a> train harder. <laughs> so it's been, it's, I've really enjoyed it, man. And, and thank you so much for, for making the time, for being a humble guy, for, for sharing, like, your experiences and, and, and just being so open, man. It's really been a pleasure. Nothing to hide. Yeah. And, and I always said that if I come onto shows or, Radio shows, television shows, or podcasts, mm. I just speak from the heart. Mm. Don't put on a front. This is who I am. If it sells, it sells. If yeah. it gets views, it gets views. But I'm always going to speak yeah. my heart, you know? I'm not yet to, to sell a show to yeah. good asses and seats. I'm yet to talk from the heart. So, yeah. so knowing that you are in the um, paramedic and, and I guess, uh, combat space um, outside of the ring as well, uh, our guys at Magnum had these amazing boots to send your way. So they're the ones Anton's wearing. I don't know if you want to lift those up. Thank you. So yeah. there. I know like boxers obviously have really pretty boots, but these are yeah. outside of the <laughs> outside of the ring. Um, and then Legum has some awesome fight gear to give you boxing gloves. Thank you. Cool. So these That's are just awesome. gifts to you to say thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's been thank it's been such a pleasure. Yeah. All right, you. guys. Well, that brings us to the end of our time together. If you've liked this episode, please give it a share, subscribe to the Just Now podcast, and uh, until next time, bye for now.